of it. All right, but the reason I use it is because I believe that social perception operates in much the same way. We can look at two human beings doing exactly the same thing, but knowledge about the culture they come from or their height or their weight, their accent, uh, their whatever it might be, their ethnicity, their gender, leads us to see them to be different. And that illusion is just as powerful as this one because they will appear to us to be doing different things even when they're doing the same. Okay? This is a picture that made the rounds after Hurricane Katrina. Both depict exactly the same event. This person and these people went into a grocery store, stole stuff, and left. Okay? Uh, what became of interest, of course, was uh, what the journalists wrote about each of these. In this case, this event was depicted as young man walking through chest deep water after having looted a grocery store. This one reported the two residents having waded through water and finding bread. Okay? Um, so the use of, of the word loot versus find is very interesting because there is surely a more neutral intermediary word that we could have been used, and that was take. Okay? So I think of looting as more negative than taking, and I think of finding as more positive than, than, uh, than taking. And in both cases, and, and I think what's going on here is something that has to do with where we sit. These journalists, I think, and I even, might feel that I look more like these people. Uh, look at them, you know, they're so nice. They even put their stolen stuff into nice backpacks. Look at them, they're, they're like us. They, they're, they're educated people. They even stole a newspaper, look. Okay. <laughs> Right? So, so the point that I want to make is that mind bugs operate in these ways. I'm quite sure that these people are not racist in any sort of standard sense of that word. Okay? But there is something that welled up in them that made them see one act as an act of looting and the other as an act of finding. Okay? Uh, we've been doing studies, uh, some of them with college students, others, in which we're using a, a technique called conjoint analysis that was developed by some mathematicians. Uh, in which you know, the worry has been, how do, you, how do you rely in the mind sciences on verbal self-report? Okay? And this has been the reason I came to this work. Not so much out of an interest in prejudice, but I came to it because I was, I was just worried about our heavy reliance on surveys and asking people what they think, knowing full well that there are real limits to what people are willing to tell us, but not even that to what people are able to know about their own minds. And so many of these techniques have been designed to try and circumvent the problem of verbal self-report, which many of you who deal with physical phenomena or biological species that don't talk to you uh, don't have to worry about. Um, so what we do in these studies is to give people lots and lots of options and say, which one would you pick? Okay, would you want option A, where you have a boss who is you know, strict, salary, location is Detroit, fake, uh, 15 days, et cetera. So you get the point. And we vary a whole bunch of this, and I won't go into the details of the technique, other than to say that if there are four or five of these dimensions, we need a minimum of about 20 plus uh, of these to derive how much emphasis people are placing on each of these variables, irrespective of what they're telling us. Okay. So they can tell us, salary matters to me, or um, vacation days matter to me. And then we can look and see if indeed they're placing weight on each of these dimensions as they're telling us. And what we find is by and large, at least our students uh, at Harvard are pretty, pretty rational. They, when they say salary matters more, they pick the place that has better salary and they give up the nicer city and so on. Uh, but here's the interesting variable. We ask them, does the gender of the boss matter to you? Does it matter if your boss is male or female? And they tell us absolutely not. Okay? And what these results show is that they're willing to give up $3,000 in salary to have a male boss. Okay? So that's what we know from computing um, the data from these. Um, likewise, oh, actually, I don't know if I have, uh, let me see if I have the, uh, what, I think I've lost that slide. But there's another one in which what we do is simply um, give, it's a similar kind of study in which um, you're picking a partner who's going to be with you on a, in a trivia contest, and you know the person's IQ and number of years of experience, and you also know how many years of college or whatever they have. Those are the things on which you ought to rely. But there's a picture, and the picture is that of either a skinny person or an overweight person. And our, our subjects are willing to give up nine IQ points uh, to have a thin partner. Okay? Completely irrational, but there it is, um, playing a role in their uh, in their decisions. And this is not um, a trivial number of IQ points to give up in this case because it's 41 percent of the, of the range. To have somebody who's, who's uh, not, to have somebody who's overweight? Is that, who said that? Okay, 
I think you have been actually throughout this conference, so maybe there are a few other things you've been. All right. Um, here we go. Social identity. Um, this is an important result, and the result is a stunning one, uh, in part because nobody ever expected it. Henry Tarshfell um, did this work in England in which he did something very simple. He divided people up into two groups, gave them a real reason to quarrel and looked to see how they divided resources among the two groups. And sure enough, you know, you do what you would find. But here is what was interesting about Tashfeld's study. He created what he thought was a control condition in which people should give and take without discriminating. And that control condition involved simply saying, those of you on this side of the room are one group and those of you on this side of the room are another group. And what he discovered was that the experiment didn't work in, in the sense that the control group discriminated just as much as the group that actually had something to really fight over. Okay? So the idea here was that a minimal group that was created based on nothing but a simple instruction that you are the overestimators and you are the underestimators, something else, you are Kandinsky lovers, you are Clay lovers, whatever might be the random distinction, actually produced in-group, out-group uh, animosity that was at the same level as the one based on real, uh, real effects, re real differences. Um, I'm going to go back to 1933 and just show you what the very first study ever done on measuring stereotypes showed. So this was done in 1933 by Katz and Braley, who went to Princeton University to find out what people believed about various ethnic groups and discover um, that this was what most people in 1933 at Princeton were willing to say. So if you go back now, and somebody's gone back every 20 years and just asked, what do you believe about each of these groups and new ones that have been now added, Asians and Arabs and so on, um, what would you expect would happen? I mean, if we, if I, and we did. We went two years ago to Princeton. Yeah, well, you know, all of the negative ones are gone. Okay? So nobody any longer says uh, any of this stuff. I mean, the, the, the data look absolutely different. Um, some of the positive ones remain. There's even a small group of people who say, that they are, they come to us after the study and say, I just want you to know that I so disliked your questionnaire, the fact that you even asked me to do this, that I took some of the qualities that belonged to one group and stuck them in the other. And I wanted to screw up your study. And I say, you know, power to you. This is great. This is what it means to say that things have changed. But how do you know where to move things to if you didn't know where they belonged? You know? and, and, and that's what I'm far more interested in, right? I'm interested in how it is that the knowledge that we have, that the Chinese are sly, conservative, and deceitful, and so on, is something that we have consciously given up in some way, uh, and yet at some implicit or unconscious level, not only hold on to, but actually use in the decisions that we've been making. So I need to bring this uh, to a close so we can have some discussion about this. I don't know, uh, where is Roger? Roger? Oh. <laughs>